We know that the thyroid hormone is responsible for increasing the metabolism by increasing oxygen consumption in every cell of the body. Now you can imagine when we would want to use drugs that mimic the thyroid hormone. Of course, in hypothyroid states. The hypothyroid states can be different. Those in the children or infants are called cretinism. Myxedema is a manifestation of hypothyroidism due to the deposition of mucopolysaccharides in the skin and causing edema, while myxedema coma is an emergency hypothyroid state. Now the symptoms of hypothyroidism is a very very long list because as I said that thyroid hormone will act on every single cell in the body and enhance it its metabolism. The metabolic effects of hypothyroidism will be decreased BMR, hypercholesterolemia, hypertriglyceridemia, hypoglycemia, positive nitrogen balance, weight gain, decreased heart rate, decreased stroke volume, decreased cardiac output, cardiac failure, pericardial effusion, lethargy and mental retardation, stiffness and muscle fatigue, decreased appetite, constipation and ascites, anemia due to decreased RBC production, may be normochromic, uh, hyperchromic or hypochromic, menorrhagia, infertility, decreased libido, impotence, oligospermia, puffy face, large tongue, pale dry skin, intolerance to cold, brittle hair and nails. Now you don't have to remember this whole list of symptoms, you can even imagine them by decreasing the metabolism in every system of the body. Now to treat all of these symptoms, the only thing we need to do is give thyroid hormone. We give it in three different preparations. One can be levothyroxine sodium, which is T4, in the form of a tablet or IV. Leothyronin, which is T3, it can be given orally or IV. Or a combination of T4 and T3 in the ratio of 4 ratio 1. Now we've already discussed the uses of these drugs, but just to be able to differentiate between the different terms, we'll do it again. It can be used in cretinism and myxedema. Now cretinism is hypothyroidism of the children or infants. So the therapy should be started as soon as possible to ensure normal growth and cognition because brain development is there. In elderly patients and those with coronary artery disease should be treated uh, with a low dose first because it can cause MI and then gradually the dose should be increased. In young adults who suffer from hypothyroidism, full replacement therapy should be done by a single dose in the morning on an empty stomach and lifelong therapy should be given. Now, myxedema coma is a medical emergency characterized by hypothermia, bradycardia, pleural effusion, pericardial effusion, and coma. Now, the doctor should start the therapy uh, on clinical diagnosis and should not wait for T3, T4, and TSH results. And the general lines will include giving levothyroxine or leothyronine IV, intravenous hydrocortisone, rewarming electrolyte balance correction, and ventilatory support. Also, thyroxine is given in benign thyroid nodules, which are basically adenomas or overgrowths of normal thyroid tissue. And the idea behind giving uh, thyroxine is that if we, if we give additional thyroxine, then maybe TSH will be inhibited and thus TSH won't stimulate more uh, thyroxine release. But this is only theoretical. It can only be used in some cases. Lastly. Thyroid hormone suppression therapy can also be used in thyroid cancers to suppress TSH and prevent its stimulation of the growth of tumor. Coming to the antithyroid drugs, we know we'll have to use them when we have hyperthyroidism or thyrotoxicosis. These drugs will inhibit thyroid hormone synthesis, release or peripheral conversion into active T3 or all of these things. Now to understand the antithyroid drugs mechanism better, we need to do a recap of thyroid hormone synthesis and release. This is a follicular thyroid cell with the colloid on the inner side and blood vessels on the outside. Iodide will be trapped by active transport by the follicular cell and then converted into iodine by the action of 
peroxidase. This iodine will then iodinate thyroglobulin tyrosine residues and convert them into monoiodotyrosine or diiodotyrosine. One MIT and one DIT will form T3, while two DITs will form T4. The T3 and T4 is yet bound to the thyroglobulin. Now when the thyroid gland is stimulated by TSH, what happens is that this complex will be ingested by endocytosis and lysed and uh, the active T3 and T4 will be released into the blood. Now as I said, the active form is T3, so peripherally T4 needs to be converted into T3 by the action of a deiodinase. Now coming to the antithyroid drugs, we can see that we can inhibit this pathway at a number of places. Firstly, we can inhibit the iodide trapping. We can also inhibit the peroxidase, inhibit iodination, inhibit coupling, or inhibit the peripheral deiodinase enzyme. Now let's classify the different antithyroid drugs and where they act, their mechanism of action, and their side effects. The first class of drugs will inhibit thyroid hormone synthesis, second will inhibit the iodide trapping, thirdly there will be hormone release inhibitors, fourthly there can be thyroid tissue destroying agents, and lastly propanolol and dexamethasone. Coming to the first class of drugs that are thyroid hormone synthesis inhibitors, they will act at three levels. First, they inhibit the peroxidase enzyme. Second, they will inhibit iodination. And thirdly, they also inhibit the coupling. The chief drugs in this class are propylthiuracil, methimazole, and carbimazole. Carbimazole on absorption is converted into methimazole. One property of propylthiuracil is that it is also a peripheral deiodinase inhibitor. And none of the other two do that. Another important property of propylthiuracil is that it is highly plasma protein bound, more than 90% is plasma protein bound, so it is safer in pregnancy than methimazole, which is less than 10% plasma protein bound and not safe. If methimazole is used in pregnancy, it will cause fetal hypothyroidism with neurological and bone abnormalities. These drugs will also cause rash, skin rash, because of the thio group, sulfur group, we know they cause allergies. A dangerous, rare and limiting side effect of these drugs is agranulocytosis. It is also a result of a hypersensitivity reaction and during this therapy, the blood, uh, blood tests should be done weekly to monitor the blood count. The next drugs that are used are the inhibitors of iodide trapping. They will inhibit the uptake of iodide. These are thiocyanates, perchlorates and other anions. They are highly toxic and their effect is unpredictable so their use has declined and they are not used anymore. Next we have the drugs which will inhibit the release of the thyroid hormone and they can also act on all the steps of the synthesis but chiefly their action is on the release. They are iodine and iodides they are the most rapid acting and oldest agents that are used. They actually have a paradoxical effect on the thyroid hormone synthesis and release at therapeutic dose. Now one thing should be kept in mind that after 2 to 8 weeks of therapy, the thyroid can escape their effect and then they will be ineffective. The chief preparations of iodine that are used for this purpose is uh, Lugol's iodine which is 5% iodine and 10% potassium iodide and also I put it sodium and iopinoic acid. Uh, these two solutions can be used preoperatively orally and what they do is they make the thyroid gland less vascular and also shrink its size so surgery will be easy and convenient with less bleeding. Allergic reactions with these solutions are common and chronic overdose with iodide will result in iodism. The next class of the drugs will act by destroying the thyroid tissue. How they act is first they get concentrated in the thyroid gland the same way as the stable iodine does and then they will emit gamma rays and beta particles. 
The beta particles will then cause destruction of the follicular cells and leading to fibrosis and the correction of hyperthyroid state. This sort of uh, approach is used to treat the hyperthyroidism that is associated with a carcinoma or a adenoma and when surgery is not feasible or contraindicated. It should not be given in pregnancy and not even to nursing mothers and not in children. Some side effects include its slow action and also the risk of hypothyroidism when there is excess tissue damage of thyroid gland. Lastly, we have the beta blocker propanolol and it is actually an inhibitor of the peripheral deiodinase enzyme and it will inhibit the conversion of T4 to T3. Other beta blockers can be used for symptomatic treatment that is to control the tachycardia, palpitation, tremors etc. Now one last thing that we need to talk about is thyrotoxic crisis or thyroid storm. This is basically a manifestation of severe hyperthyroidism and it will manifest as hyperpyrexia, cardiac arrhythmias, uh, for example atrial fibrillation, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea and mental confusion. It is due to an infection, trauma, surgery, a diabetic ketoacidosis or any sort of stress can precipitate this thyroid storm. The treatment of thyrotoxic crisis should be prompt and the patient should be hospitalized. Supportive care should be given. The pyrexia should be managed with cooling blankets, hydration. The patient should be sedated and if the attack is precipitated by an infection, antibiotics should be used to treat the infection. Propylthiuracil and oral iodide should be given to inhibit the thyroid hormones. Intravenous propanolol or hydrocortisone should be given to prevent the peripheral conversion of T4 to T3 and if propanolol is contraindicated for example in asthmatics then deltaism can be given. That's all.